Okay, partial differential equations. So first I'll give you the lay of the land. Two distinct worlds in differential equations. Ordinary differential equations, ODEs, and partial differential equations, PDEs. This course is about PDEs, but we'll start here. So here's how I see it. Well, here's the formal difference. In ODEs, ordinary differential equations, all of their known functions are function of one variable only. We usually think of that variable as time, t. So all of our known functions, whether it's one or many, it doesn't really matter. They're all functions of just one variable, and that makes all the difference in the world. And the reason we think of that variable as t is both traditional and also where most of the applications are. Mostly these equations describe evolution in time of discrete objects. And it's with ODEs that physics and modern science started. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. It doesn't have to be time, it can be another variable. But I think if you're trying to grasp what are these equations about, it's good to think of that one variable as time. So all sorts of things are possible. When we talk about PDEs, and there will be, of course, more than one independent variable, things will change. But we can have one variable or many variables, one unknown function or many unknown functions. You can have many unknown functions in both cases. In fact, you typically have a system of equations and not just a single equation. And that actually, how many equations you have, doesn't make much of a difference at all. It typically doesn't make equations more complicated or less solvable or more difficult to think about. Of course, we usually start with just one unknown function. But ultimately, that's not what makes the biggest difference. What makes the biggest difference is how many independent variables you have. And here, you have just one. And here, I'll use a different letter, you will have many. And of course, that's dictated by what kind of problems in physics these equations came from. So I'll talk about that in just a moment. So x and y are usually used for spatial variables. You might have a function of two spatial variables, x and y, or x, y, and z. Or there might be evolution mixed in, in which case it will also be a function of t and spatial variables. And so let me categorize these two different kinds of equations in the broadest terms possible. Easy, impossible. That's, that's how you should look at equations. And over the next few minutes, I'll describe what I mean by that. And of course, it depends on where these equations come from and what we do to solve them. OK, first, where do these equations come from? Well, these, you can look all the way back to Newton in his formulation of the laws that govern the solar system. His problem was you have individual planets moving around the sun, or maybe all celestial bodies moving around in some way. So his unknowns were the paths of the planets. And there were many planet, planets. I don't know how many planets Newton was aware of, probably about six. So there were many planets. Each planet had three coordinates. So that right there is 18 unknown functions. But they all just moved in time. So he had to describe their motion in time. So even though he was faced with a system that had very many unknowns, excuse me, that's right, no, I was right, that has very many unknowns, there was only a single independent variable, time. Everything was just a function of time. The position of the Earth was just a function of time. And his goal was to predict where the Earth will be at the next moment of time, or a year later, or trace its whole evolution. So that's Newton's equations. That's where it started. Newton's equations are ODEs. They describe time evolution of discrete objects. Now, Newton's equations, coupled with the law of gravitation, are actually difficult to solve in the 18th, maybe I should start with 17th, 18th, 19th, first half of the 20th century sense, where to solve an equation meant that you were able to write 
f of t equals and some mathematical expression. So all of 18th century and 19th century was devoted to trying to solve complicated ordinary and also partial differential equations. And mathematicians got really good at it. Phenomenal. And they continuously expanded, continually, expanded the definition of what it means to be a mathematical expression. They threw in integrals that they could write but not evaluate. They threw in more sophisticated functions and called them elementary functions. All sorts of things. And they were able to solve very, very many ODEs. Probably up to 1% of ODEs. I don't know, I'm just throwing out a number. So most ODEs are still difficult to solve in that sense. However, I still stay by my stand by my statement that these are simple. These are still easy to solve, relatively speaking. Someone who's an expert in ODEs might argue with me on that point because they're studying something that's hard. But I just want to get the general idea across. These are easy. I'll explain why in a moment. But that's what these equation ODEs are for. Typically, time evolution or some other evolution of a discrete, of a discrete system of objects. Each one is on its own. The neighbors don't matter. Now we go to the entirely different world of partial differential equations. Where do partial differential equations arise? Well, basically, again, this will be just a fraction of all applications, but continuum mechanics, where you have a three-dimensional body that can change its shape or position. There are dislocations, displacements, strain stresses, and so forth. Of course, it's not just uh, limited to mechanics. Of course, fluids are in that system, are in that category. The most movement of air, which is also a fluid, and lots of other things where things depend on space as well as possibly time. So my favorite system, I should have worn that t-shirt, is fluid film equations, so bubbles and how they evolve. In some ways, they're very complicated equations in terms of solving them not in terms of formulating them. So that's where these equations come from. Mechanics, plasticity, material science, financial engineering. If you know a little bit about options, options depend on two things, roughly speaking. How much time is left to expiration and the price of the stock that they're related to. Anybody's into financial options? OK? But that, those will be described by Black-Scholes equation, which is related to one of the equations that we'll discuss. So the price of an option is a function of time, but also the price of the stock. Two independent variables. Two independent variables. And if you assume that other parameters move, like interest rates, volatility, then it's a function of those variables as well. And that makes it more and more complicated. And here we come to the, very, to the most fundamental difference between ODEs and PDEs, which is the domain of the definition. Where are these functions defined? And just by, by virtue of how many variables there are, you can pretty much tell. These functions can only be defined on a straight line. Or maybe you can think of it as the time axis. Back into the shot, out of the shot, in the shot. OK, starts at some time, maybe 0, goes to some other time, t. All the action happens on this segment. And it's not that it's 1 here and maybe 2 there. 1 independent variable here and 2 independent variables there. But a fundamental change takes place when you're talking about equations like this. For example, the equilibrium shape of an eraser, if you twist, if you took it and twisted it, We'll talk about it in two dimensions, but it's really in three dimensions, right? So here you have an entire domain of definition. And in the case of a square eraser, it, the domain on which you have to solve your equations looks like this. If it's one of those kids uh, erasers in the shape of a snowman, this would be your domain of definition. 
So things change in terms of complexity, change dramatically. This dependence on shape is one of the most difficult and intriguing aspects of partial differential equations. It will be called boundary conditions. Here, we don't really have boundary conditions because there is no boundary. Everything starts somewhere. Again, I'm talking about the majority of the equations. Somebody will say, well, aren't there ODEs that, yes, there are. But in essence, if you want to grasp the spirit of ODEs, you start somewhere and then you evolve. And that's the solution. There are initial conditions. You have to start somewhere. Depending on the equation, you sometimes have to specify, well, just how fast you're changing at the initial moment. That's how Newton's equations work. To predict where the body is going to be after some time, you have to specify where it starts and its initial velocity, right? So if I want to predict the path of this chalk, I can just, that was a nice try, let go of it, and that would be initial velocity zero. Or I could throw it and release it at this very point, and the trajectories would be different, even though the ODE is the same. The, equa the differential equation itself is the same, but the trajectory is different. So that's initial conditions. Initial conditions. I won't write that, but I'll just write initial conditions. And that's all that you, in terms of boundaries, that's all you have to deal with when you're talking about ODEs. With PDEs, it's so much more complicated and therefore so much more interesting. Because number one, you have to specify the domain. That's already an infinite amount of information. To specify the domain in case of ODEs, you just have to say where it started and where it stopped. Because it's just one parameter, one independent variable. Here, you have to specify the shape of the domain. In some problems, that even comes up in financial mathematics when you're dealing with American options, if you know what that is. Uh, you don't even have the domain of the definition because determining the domain of the definition is actually part of the equation. It's, th it's that complicated. Sometimes the domain deforms as you go along. If you're modeling a soap bubble, you're solving for velocities and so forth on the surface of the soap bubble, which is deforming as you're doing it. So the domain can deform and its deformation is also dictated by the equation. So just to start go, just to get going with PDs, you need an infinite amount of information, so to speak, infinite number of points. I'm just trying to emphasize how different and more complicated they are. I'm not, I don't mean to throw the word infinity around lightly. And sometimes, when you're talking about evolution, for example, you let the eraser go and it starts vibrating a little bit and then stops, then it's a matter of not only uh, boundary conditions. Well, I didn't even say what boundary conditions are, so let me just say boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are part of all partial differential equations. But if you just think about the equilibrium shape of the eraser when you twisted it, right, you imposed the displacement at one end and at the other. But in the middle, it does something according to its equations of equilibrium, which are partial differential equations. So you specified what the displacements are here, because you're holding it. And you specified what the displacements are here, once again, because you're holding it. Okay. But everywhere else, it's free to move around so that it satisfies the equilibrium equations. So because you impose the displacement here and here, uh, you've imposed boundary conditions. That's the boundary on which you impose these conditions, on which the function is known. Here, it's only one point. Here, it's along the entire boundary of the domain. And for the equations that I'm talking about, you not only have to specify some conditions on the boundaries where you're actually holding the eraser, but actually on these boundaries as well. And so what are those conditions? Well, you have to do a little bit more analysis, but you need some conditions there. So you typically need just the right number of conditions all around the boundary. And that's if you're solving static problems that are fixed in time. If you go to dynamic problems, 
that not only are there boundary conditions that depend on, that may depend on time. For example, if you keep going like this with an eraser. But also initial conditions where you start, similar to this. So if it's a time evolution of a continuum system, then it's not only boundary conditions, but initial conditions as well. And so it's very interesting. So boundary conditions and initial conditions are, in the case of partial differential equations, especially if I may refer to the world of the equations that I'm interested in, are more than half of the problem. Just thinking it through, making sure your solution satisfies those equations is just as difficult as the rest of the problem. In ODEs, initial conditions are kind of an afterthought. They're kind of an afterthought. Because you can kind of typically solve the equation in such a way that you solve it for all possible initial conditions. So you'll have some undetermined constants in there. You will solve it for all possible initial conditions. And then at the end, you'll say, well, here, I've solved it for all possible initial conditions with some undetermined constants. Well, now I will actually go ahead and look at my initial conditions and adjust those constants so that my solution satisfies the initial conditions. It's almost an afterthought. It's the boring part of ODEs. The fun part in ODEs, if you do it analytically, is to find that solution, that expression, if you want to do it analytically, that captures all possible solutions, regardless of the initial conditions. And that is called the general solution. And theoretically, even though you might not be able to find, find it easily. It's always available. You may always be able to write your solution, f of t, as some function of time and however many undetermined constants you need. And we'll see examples of this with the simplest possible equations, which is the ones we're occupied in this class, which will occupy us in this class. And this is called the general solution. The general solution, just like in linear algebra. Except in linear algebra, I may be the only person who calls that the general solution, because it's so analogous to differential equations. I actually, I have to confess, I don't know if linear algebra uses this terminology, general solution. <laughs> it does now. Uh, but this co really comes from ordinary differential equations. So every ordinary differential equation has a general solution, which is that kind of expression that uh, captures all possible solutions to the equation, just focuses on the differential part. And then by adjusting these two coefficients, you will be able to satisfy your initial conditions. Oh yeah? Success. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm not. You were right all along. I was right all along. That's the good way of looking at it. I'm not original. I'm not. Too bad. Okay. Uh, general solutions in PDEs don't even exist as a concept. So you can't even you can't even begin to talk about it. It's just I'm I'm only writing it down so I can erase it as violently as I possibly can. It's just a different realm. This is not even attempted this sort of thing. Uh, let me give you another uh, angle on how these are simple and these are complicated. I think you can, even in this day and age, you can pretty much be an expert on ordinary differential equations. You can be an expert on ordinary differential. There's no such thing as an expert on partial differential equations. You can only be an expert on one little sub-kind sub sub kind of differential equations. It's like saying, uh, I need heart surgery. Can you recommend someone? And somebody gives you the name of a surgeon. Well, I think you'll want to know that that surgeon is a heart surgeon, not a foot surgeon, right? You guys agree with me? That's how specialized PDEs are. You know, there are surgeons who specify in a particular ligament of a particular finger or the wrist, right? That's the level of specialization in surgery. It's that or more uh, as far as specialization goes in partial differential equations. They're all different. 
They're all different. Sometimes you would change a plus to a minus, and all of a sudden you're in a different industry. We'll see that. You know, that's, that's the difference between Laplace equation and the heat equation. One is one derivative plus another derivative. That's Laplace equation, the Laplace equation. The other one is one derivative minus the other derivative. Well, wave equation, sorry, depending on the details, right? But totally different industry, okay? That's, that's the difference. So all we'll really be able to do in this class is give you a little bit of a survey of partial differential equations. It's what they are, what it means to solve one, how they interface to the real world. What is, I guess, I'd like to throw in some history. You know, how did they evolve if the opportunity presents itself and if I know it, okay?